Hi, sixth grade. It's Miss Perkins reading chapter two of A Night Divided. I like how each chapter starts with a quote. Chapter two starts with, you are your only border. Throw yourself over it. Chapter two starts on page four. I had known something bad was coming ever since the knock on our door Friday evening, two days before the fence. We were in the middle of supper. My parents were discussing the day's news as they always did. Hatred between the East and West was growing, and Berlin seemed to be caught in the center of what the world described as a Cold War, a standoff of loud threats and puffed-out chests. Hopefully it wouldn't lead to anyone bringing out their guns. Germany still hadn't recovered from the last war. Across the table from me, Fritz and Dominic were debating who should get the last dumpling, the oldest brother or the hungriest. And I was telling them all to be quiet, that I heard something. Someone knocked again. This time, everyone went silent. Papa wiped his mouth with a napkin, and after a warning glance for us to remain calm, he went to answer the door. Though my mother whispered that everything was fine, I was already nervous. Whenever unexpected knocks came, my heart waited to hear to beat again until I knew who it was. Eight years ago, my father had been involved in some worker uprising in Berlin. He had never been arrested for that and insisted that he had done nothing to deserve any special attention. But the Stasi, our secret police force, seemed to disagree. Every few months they came asking him questions, looking at him as if he had already been found guilty of something. I always wondered if they were waiting for a reason to take him away. This time, however, my father's voice faded into a smile. And in a welcoming voice he said, Herr Krauss. Then he pulled the older man into the apartment with a warm embrace. Have you eaten supper, my friend? Thank you, but I can't stay. Herr Krauss lived next door with his invalid wife. He was a bit odd collecting scraps of anything that wasn't nailed down and stuffing them wherever the Stasi might not look. He and my father had known each other for as long as I could remember and had been at that uprising together. Mama once told me he definitely should have been arrested and they weren't wise to associate with them. But when he came in, she left her seat and gave him a polite greeting. The more she disliked our company, the nicer Mama was. A lesson learned from our visits with the Stasi. How can we help you, she asked. Herr Krauss kissed her cheek, then dismayed any then, then dismissed any further pleasantries with a frown at my father. We need to talk. Papa invited him to sit down while Mama said, Children, go to your rooms. We stood to obey her, but Papa said, Fritz should stay. No, Alvis. He's 14 years old. Fritz should stay. Mom gave in on that argument, but waved Dominic and me off to our rooms. However, I only went to my bedroom door down the hallway, shut it as if I had gone inside, then crept back to the corner. Dominic watched me with an amused smile, then did the same thing. The whispers are growing louder, Herr Krauss said. The government has got to act before East Germany is completely empty. I already understood that. Our government government had closed the border years ago, hoping to stop the flood of people leaving for the brighter lights of the West. But there were always ways through, and trying to keep people in had only made it worse. Another family from our apartment building had left just yesterday, disappearing without a word to anyone. The same thing was happening all over East Germany, especially here in the city. So, you think they'll begin arresting people who try to leave? Mama asked. No, her craft said. I think it'll be worse than that. Your family must get over to the west while you still can. From around the corner, I nodded in agreement. Why couldn't my mother see what was so obvious to Papa and Herr Krauss and so many others who felt trapped here beneath Moscow's thumb? According to Papa, for the last 16 years, Germany had been split between the East and the West. Our people divided for no reason other than what street they happened to live on.
That was part of our punishment for losing the Second World War. Break our country into pieces so we couldn't rise up and threaten the world again. The way Hitler had done. Now Britain, America, and France controlled the western half of Germany, as well as half of the capital city of Berlin. Russia controlled the east, where my family lived. At first, it didn't matter much to us. Most people shopped, worked, or visited, just as they always had. And crossing the border wasn't much more difficult than crossing the street. But Russia's promises of a better life under communism weren't happening. As the West repaired its war damages, ours remained like unhealed scars. Their shops were full, and ours constantly faced shortages. They were growing stronger while we leaned on Russia like a crutch, pretending to be every bit as strong. People had noticed the widening gap between our countries. As more East Berliners left each week, those of us who remained whispered in dark corners about, what if we left too? I heard them. I watched as neighbors and friends made their plans to go. My father was one of those who whispered, our family would have gone to the West months ago if Mama had let us. She was just as stubborn as he was, I suppose. They argued about it all the time. In whispers, of course. Berlin was a symphony of whispers. But this was also our home, and Mama couldn't imagine leaving any more than she could think about ceasing to be German. Choose to go now, Herr Kraus said, or soon you will have no choice. You want us to leave the life we built here, Mama asked. My widowed mother lives just outside the city, and she needs my help. Should I leave her too? Would she ask you to stay here, Herr Kraus said, where it's dangerous to speak or act or even think? It's only dangerous because you fill my husband's head with ideas he should not have. Then Mama lowered her voice. This was not the kind of conversation she wanted our neighbors to hear, at least not the neighbors who might report us to the Stasi. She turned her attention to Papa. Besides, our children are in school. And you have a secure job. They have schools in the West, Papa said. We can find a new home and a new job. The refugee camps in the West are crowded and don't have enough food to go around. Mama shook her head. After the war, she had gone for months without enough food to eat. Thousands of Germans died of hunger back then, and I know that memory was never far from her. We have no family or friends there to take us in. And I won't bring my children into a camp. We're not beggars. I'd rather beg than live here. I had left my hiding place and spoke even before I remembered I was supposed to be in my room. But it was too late to go back, so I added, please, Mama, listen to them. You should be in bed, Gertha. What if Aldous goes to the West for a night or two, Herr Krauss suggested. He can find you an apartment and ask about jobs. Papa's voice brightened. I could leave tonight and be back on Sunday. We don't have to decide anything for sure until I come back. Mama was silent for a moment. Then she said, bring one of the children with you so the employers know you have a family to support. I'll go, Fritz offered. I knew he would. Last week, Fritz told me he wanted to buy some of the West magazines and come back here to sell them to his friends. You need to help your mother with packing, and Goethe is too young, Papa said. I'll take Dominic. Dominic came around the corner now, smiling as if he had won some sort of prize. I glared at him, but the truth was, I thought he had won a prize too. Why couldn't Papa bring me instead? I asked Papa that very question as he tucked me in bed that night. He smiled and pulled the blankets up to my chin. It's going to be difficult getting across the border in the darkness, he said. Dominic and I will find a way, then return and show it to you in only a few more nights. What if you don't come back? His eyes became sad, through the, though the smile remained. I must come back because nobody else knows our bedtime song. 
He got to his feet and started dancing to my favorite song, The Farmer in March, which described all the chores a farmer must do to get his crops ready. They have a lot to do in the home and the garden, he sang, as he began pantomiming the words. They dig and they rake and they sing the song. I sang along with him to the very last line. Then he kissed my cheek, wished me a good night's sleep, and closed the door of my room, saying, I'll see you on Sunday, Gerda. No, he wouldn't, because two days later, our city would be surrounded with an endless fence of wire and thorn. As I was about to learn, he would never come back. Eventually, Mama dried her tears and told me and Fritz to go get dressed, that we ought to go see the fence for ourselves. It was still very early in the morning, and large bulldozers could be heard, already tearing down homes or hundred-year-old trees that were in the way of the fence. Along with most of the people in my neighborhood, I stood on the road facing the guns that faced us. Mama held one of my hands and Fritz held the other. No one around me cried, and even the strongest men, not even the strongest men, fought back. Why didn't we? I looked around waiting for someone to rush at the officers in a cry for freedom. Then others would join in and fight until we overpowered the guards and showed them we refused to be held here like criminals. Or until enough of us were shot, the guards looked prepared to do that if necessary. Probably everyone here already understood that because, like me, they only stood and watched. Maybe we were all too empty for tears and too horrified for words. When I asked Fritz when Papa and Dominic would be able to come home, he only knelt beside me and shook his head. Quietly, he whispered, Papa was part of the resistance, Gerta. Or they think he was. As long as that fence is up, they will never let him come home, and he won't send Dominic back to this place, but don't worry. I'm sure it can't last long. The people around me had already given a name to this day, Barbed Wire Sunday, the day that divided a city, and eventually a country. Worst of all, the day that divided my family. The sun warmed my back as it slowly rose in the east and I shivered against it. This early morning light had not ended the long dark night. No, for us, the dark night had only begun. That is the end of chapter two. Thank you for listening.